Welcome to United Network News, the official news channel for CARE, the Center for Amity and Restoration of Earth. I'm Sam. And then you get the real news. Through our field messengers, we show you the truth about what's really taking place in our communities. We also bring you stories to help you remember who you are and why you're here, as well as regional stories that impact the people. And our World Situation Report reveals what's happening throughout the multiverse. We are here to restore Earth. In the U.S., it is July 5th, 2024. We're taking a look at the life work of Romanian sculptor Constantine Brancusi. These outdoor sculptures contain a deep meaning to help connect you to the divine. Then we'll head to the Ozarks in Missouri to learn more about its natural beauty that draws visitors from all around the world. Essential oils have amazing health benefits, but how do you know you're getting the good stuff? We've got some tips for buyers. A country in Africa is cracking down on the use of foreign currencies, specifically the dollar, with some tough penalties for anyone breaking the rules. And Thailand considers ending a 52-year ban on afternoon booze to help boost the local economy. This is Caitlin Gipp, messenger for United Network News. Here's a look at today's field messenger reports from all around the world. The work of renowned Romanian sculptor Constantin Brancusi is displayed in major museums worldwide. His sculptures invite visitors to experience inner harmony and divine connection. UNN field messenger Monica highlights these important works. Hello, I'm Monica in Romania, Field Messenger reporting for UNN. Brancusi's work are in the Museum of Modern Art, New York, and other museums around the world. Brancusi's work are also in the National Museum of Art of Romania in Bucharest, and the artist's gift to his beloved country is the monumental ensemble in Turgujiu, a town near his native village, which includes three sculptures, the Table of Silence, the Gate of the Kiss, and the Endless Column. The ensemble is considered one of the great works of 20th century outdoor sculpture. The entrance to Central Park, where you, we can admire this ensemble, is under the gate of the kiss, which seems to make the transition to a higher dimension framed by symbols and meanings. The path continues with the alley of chairs, which has 15 hourglass-shaped chairs on its edges, suggesting moments of contemplation on the stages of life and at the end of this path is the table of silence. So, once you have passed through the gate of the kiss into inner harmony and unconditional love for all divine creation and walk the path of life through awareness and acceptance, you will surely reach the table of silence at the altar of your soul, the place where you meet God. Thank you for watching. Bye. Located in the serene landscape of southeast Missouri, this park offers a tranquil escape into nature's embrace. UNN field messenger Leah explores the park's rich history and natural beauty. Hi, my name is Leah Christie with United Network News, coming to you from the beautiful Johnson Sutton State Park in the Ozark in Southeast Missouri. The term shut-in comes from a narrow constriction of the gorge. You can actually see that it actually constricts and narrows towards here, towards this side which gets its name Shut-In Park. The history of these beautiful ancient lands goes back to 700 BC, where the Osage Indian tribe lived off the land 
until the 17th century where they migrated west. Following the colonization, the park was the mid 19th century homestead of the Johnson family. After three generations of living on the land, it was sold to a civic leader and conservationist, Joseph Deloge. Over a 17 year period, he assembled most of the park, including shut-ins and two miles of river frontage. Mr. Deloge then donated the park to the state of Missouri in 1955. Johnson's Shut-In State Park is 8,781 acres and adjoins with Tomsock Mountain and together the two cover more than 16,000 acres of the Missouri Ozarks. While I was walking through this majestic land, it was hard to imagine that in the early morning hours of December 14, 2005, the Tomsock Upper Reservoir malfunctioned stripping the land of vegetation and soil down to the bedrock. These lands prove that Mother Nature always finds its way back and restores herself. Thank you for coming along with me on this beautiful journey. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We want you to become a UNN Field Messenger. These are everyday people just like you who want to make a difference in their community. You don't need any special training or equipment. Just use the camera on your mobile phone and show us what's happening in your area. You send us your videos and our production team will create the report for you. Our new website is now up and running at unitednetwork.earth. You can submit your Field Messenger reports directly through the Field Messenger tab at the top of the page. You can also email your reports to our new email address at fieldmessenger at unitednetwork.earth. Hey, I'm Kirsten from Switzerland. This is Wayne from Tucson. Hi, my name is Desmond from Ghana. I am Claudia from Dawsonville, Georgia. I'm Mikey from Pretoria, South Africa. Hi, I'm Steve McGrath, Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada. People from all around the world are coming together. Happy day, beautiful world. We are here in a rather small urban garden, and this video is just to show you the joys that we've had in this garden with electric gardening. When news happens in their area, they show us what's really going on. We have people in the streets protesting for and against. At United Network News, our field messengers are changing the face of news. This is Field Messenger Helen reporting with Nature and I'm going to talk to you about the bees again. Take the next step in restoring our planet. Become a UNN Field Messenger today. Hi, I'm Stephanie from South Africa. If it's going to be, it's up to me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. 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 It's up to all of us. We're UNN, and we're taking back the news. Many of us are seeking natural remedies to support our health and well-being. Essential oils have emerged as a popular solution, offering a range of benefits from stress relief to improve sleep quality. However, not all essential oils are created equal. Stephanie Ariel is a certified aromatherapist, author, and owner of Artisan Aromatics, a scent design company. She says the quality of the oils you use can significantly impact their effectiveness and safety. So we're learning all about essential oils today, and Stephanie is back with us. Stephanie, how do we know if we're getting quality essential oils? Because I feel like everybody and their brother is selling these now. <laughs> like if you were to go on, let's just say Amazon, there'd be like a gazillion different providers and a you know, gazillion different prices. Then we have, you know, companies that that's pretty much all they do is sell essential oils, you know, and you've got your grandmother and your aunt telling you to buy essential oils. So I just feel like it's, it's kind of all over the map. How do we know that we're getting the good stuff? Yeah, and it's such an important question because if you're buying real essential oils, you are investing your hard earned dollars into these. They're not cheap, if they're real and authentic. So you do wanna know that you're getting a high quality oil. And it really does start from where you're getting it. So you wanna make sure that it is a seller who specializes in selling essential oils, not just one thing among many products. You wanna make sure that they can offer a download of a GCMS test report. That's a third party test that verifies um, the chemistry, the quality, the authenticity of the oil. 
If they don't have that, you may save a lot of money. You may find this on Amazon for $5 or somewhere else for $10, but you don't actually know if you're getting an essential oil. You literally could be getting a synthetic replication. You could be getting something fully diluted in a carrier oil, or you could be getting a perfume diluted, you know, all kinds of iterations that are not essential oils. So I would say, you know, skip the, this is not a place to save money, like skip the supermarket oils or the online big box seller oils and look for those niche providers who really, that's what they do day in, day out. They know who they're buying from because they're buying from growers, distilleries, or much larger distributors, but they have their sources and they're typically run by aromatherapists, people who really know what they're doing. So just buy from someone you trust. You don't have to go to those huge MLM companies because a lot of what you're paying for with them is the marketing and the commissions of the hierarchical structure. So I would look for a small, more boutique type of a essential oil company to buy from or a healing practitioner that you trust that they may be private labeling from one of those suppliers. But it really just, it all comes down to where you buy it. Just really select that carefully, and then you can buy all your oils from that provider. Is there a way to kind of smell some of these oils in advance? Because sometimes I'm on a site and I'm like, that's a cool name. I have no idea what that smells like, you know? <laughs> but I'm also concerned that even if I went to someone in person and said, hey, do you have this? Can I smell that? That it might vary from provider to provider, you know, depending on, you know, how diluted something is, or, you know, maybe there's other factors too. So do you have any advice for people like me that are more, you know, newer to this and trying to experiment around, but some of those, you know, smells and stuff, sometimes I, I can't, you know, and I'm so nervous, I'm going to invest some money into something. And then it's going to be something I don't like at all. Yeah, exactly. That is such a good question because it will vary and I'll speak to why it will vary. But I would look for a seller, a niche provider who they're a boutique shop. They sell us only essential oils. They will sell sample vials so you can get inexpensive vials. So that's the way to go. On my store, artisanaromatics.com, we have a sets of five sample vials for 20 or $25. And I always encourage people who are new to it, just start with that. You know, why not order a couple of those and just spread out all the vials and decide what resonates with you before you buy a larger bottle. And it is so important to smell first because, so a couple of reasons why oils will vary, whether it's a blend or a certain oil like lavender. Mm -hmm. um, from provider to provider. So we, for example, carry seven variations of lavender. They're from Bulgaria, from all over France, high altitude, low altitude, wild crafted, where it's just picked out in nature versus cultivated. We have one from the USA. All seven of these varieties smell different. So where you get the plant, where it grows, grows the terroir, you know, that, that French word that talks about the climate, the dirt, all the ambient um, environmental factors go into the ultimate smell of the oil, whether you buy one from someone who produced it in her backyard versus a lavender from France, they're all gonna smell different. So that's one reason. The, the second reason is more interesting that I've been noticing lately, which is, well, maybe it's not more interesting, but it's, it's more new to my consciousness about this. Where you smell an oil will also impact how it smells. So whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whether you're in your car, mm. whether you just exercised or had Thai food for lunch, all the, you know, because we're biological beings and we're sort of interacting with the oil when we smell it. So yeah. every person who smells it will smell something different because their own chemistry is blending with it and what they ate or you know how when you walk into a certain person's home and you're hit with a smell of like yeah. eating food or so you know it just smells like that family and they can't smell it anymore it's just who they yeah. are <laughs> mm -hmm. but um and you can't smell your own home necessarily so it's that kind of thing so i you know have blends that some people love and other people doesn't resonate at all because it's all so unique how we each smell and perceive an essential oil Solar panels are making their way onto unexpected surfaces, including balcony rails across Central Europe. More than 400,000 German households have already installed solar panels on their balconies. These panels are easy to install and are often done by the homeowners themselves. They are ideal for homes lacking the structural strength for rooftop panels. 
During winter months, balcony panels can sometimes generate more power than rooftop panels due to the low angle of the sun. The financial benefits are also significant with the investment typically paying for itself in three to five years through electricity savings. This affordability makes solar energy more accessible to a wider range of people, promoting a more sustainable lifestyle. This innovation is part of Europe's inventive approach to solar energy, including unique installations in France, Switzerland, Italy, and the Netherlands. In Amsterdam, an initiative to transform rooftops into botanical spaces is making a huge difference to areas prone to flooding. The concept known as Sponge City involves installing gardens of water-loving plants and soil on rooftops. These gardens absorb excess rainwater, which can then be used in buildings for tasks like flushing toilets or watering plants. When heavy rains are predicted, a smart valve system releases stored water into the municipal drains, freeing up rooftop space to absorb more water. So far, 45,000 square meters of roofs in Amsterdam have been fitted with these systems. These green roofs can hold more than 120,000 gallons of water, promising long-term savings on water utilities and damage repair. Besides flood control, these green roofs cool buildings naturally and assist solar panels in generating more energy. By reducing flooding and conserving water, Amsterdam's sponge rooftops offer a sustainable solution for urban areas worldwide. Young people in Somaliland, Southern Africa, are transforming their city's public spaces using the popular video game, Minecraft. In Minecraft, users create structures and virtual blocks, and it has become a powerful tool for city design. As part of a project introduced in 2019, youth have been empowered to take active roles in urban planning. 47 young residents identified key city issues, and a group of 15 went on to design the Hargeisa Stadium Park using Minecraft. The game's accessibility means that even those with minimal formal education can easily learn and participate. Their imaginative plans include playgrounds, sports facilities, basic services, and safe areas for women and girls. Despite some delays, the park is now being built, incorporating their innovative ideas. This project shows how involving youth in city planning ensures future development meets the needs of all residents while empowering the next generation. We are United Network News. Every day we release real stories from real people all over the world. Hill Messenger reporting from Gold Coast, Australia. Denmark. Canada. Uganda. From Atlanta. In Southern California. In their own words, people like you share what's really happening in their area. At UNN, you are the news. You are creating a new world with infinite possibilities. You are the restoration plan. Come join us for the real news every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, only on United Network. We're UNN, and we're taking back the news. The Bank of Zambia has introduced draft rules meant to reduce the use of foreign currencies, particularly the U.S. dollar, in local transactions. The new regulations will require the Zambian currency to be used for all domestic transactions, both public and private. This measure aims to strengthen the national currency and reduce the pressure on the exchange rate. The increasing use of dollars in the local economy has become a concern for the central bank as it undermines monetary policy tools and raises credit and liquidity risks. The bank warns individuals caught using foreign currencies for local transactions could face severe penalties, including up to 10 years in prison or substantial fines. Previously, restrictions on dollar use were implemented in 2012, but lifted less than two years later.
Portugal's new government plans to reintroduce tax breaks to attract foreign workers, but will exclude wealthy expatriate pensioners. The tax breaks reintroduce a 20% flat rate of income tax, covering salaries and professional income, but excluding dividends, capital gains, and pensions. This move aims to stimulate growth by attracting young, highly skilled workers, addressing the country's economic challenges without burdening the health system with retirees. The tax regime does not include property purchase requirements and is also available to Portuguese citizens who have lived abroad. The central bank, however, warns this plan may push the country from a fiscal surplus into a budget deficit, potentially breaching European Union debt rules. Amsterdam, the capital of the Netherlands, has announced a significant reduction in the number of cruise ships allowed to dock in its harbor. Currently, 190 ships dock annually, but this will drop to 100 by 2026, with an outright ban in the city by 2035, after a new terminal outside the city is complete. The move responds to resident concerns about pollution and crowding, worsened by a surge in day visitors and overnight stays, which reached 22.1 million last year. Locals say the influx burdens public transport and narrow streets, diminishing their enjoyment of the city. Efforts include onshore power requirements for ships by 2027 and broader measures to curb public antisocial behavior and restrict short stay apartments. Critics worry about the economic impact, but officials argue it's crucial for long-term sustainability. The collapse of the UK firm Small World has disrupted vital money transfers, causing significant hardships for people in developing countries. The company, part of LL or LCC Transcending, which enabled cash pickups in more than 170 countries, stopped trading on June 10th. A statement on the company's website confirmed they have stopped processing new transactions across all platforms. Customers reported recent payments have failed to arrive, leaving many families without funds for essential needs such as food. LCC Transcending Trading under various names, including Small World, Money Transfer, and Global Link, has announced it will not be accepting new clients. Gran Thornton, the assigned admitter, is working to return owed amounts to UK customers, but warned this process would include deducting costs associated with recovery and return. Argentina is set to almost double its lithium production capacity with the launch of four new projects. Currently, only three mines export lithium, positioning Argentina as a major producer behind Australia, Chile, and China. The new projects are expected to ramp up annual capacity by 79%. These projects are crucial for Argentina's economy, which is facing stringent currency controls. They are located in the Andes Mountains within South America's Lithium Triangle. The first project inauguration is scheduled for next week. This development coincides with recent federal reforms offering tax, currency, and customs benefits to industrial investors, further supporting the growth of Argentina's lithium sector. Canada has introduced a new digital services tax targeting large foreign tech companies. Effective starting June 28th, the tax imposes a 3% levy on digital services revenue earned from Canadian users exceeding 20 million Canadian dollars or 14.7 million US dollars annually. This will apply to firms with global revenues more than 1.1 billion Canadian dollars or 810 million US dollars, mainly affecting US companies like Alphabet and Meta Platforms. The move may lead to higher costs for Canadian consumers who use these digital services. Despite agreements already in place in seven other countries like the UK and France, 
U.S. officials consider the tax unfair and have threatened potential retaliation. The finance minister indicated the tax could be rescinded if a global tax treaty is ratified, though this has not yet occurred. Global streaming companies, including Netflix and Walt Disney, are challenging new Canadian rules requiring them to fund local news. Represented by the Motion Picture Association Canada, these companies argue the government's mandate lacks a legal basis and is unreasonable. The Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission introduced regulations in June requiring major streaming services to allocate 5% of their Canadian revenues to support local broadcasting, including news. This decision aims to benefit local radio and TV news, French language content, and Indigenous programming. However, streaming companies argue this creates financial strain and could impact their operations and offerings in Canada. Recent studies show gambling addiction is a significant issue amongst U.S. veterans, affecting up to 10.7% in certain regions. To combat this, the Department of Veteran Affairs, or VA, has established two residential treatment centers and numerous partnerships with civilian facilities. Despite the VA's proactive stance, the Department of Defense has not increased resources to address this issue across the board. Service members are screened annually for gambling disorders and treatment is available without penalization. However, gambling education policies vary widely across military bases. Advocacy groups argue the military needs consistent education and treatment policies for gambling, similar to protocols for substance abuse. Some casinos target service members with promotions, but not all align with ethical practices. About 1.5 million adults in Singapore will receive cash in August to help with daily living expenses. The amount, either $450 or $850, depends on their home's annual value. This aid is an increase from last year. Citizens 21 and older with an annual income of up to $34,000 will qualify, but those with more than one property will not. Senior Singapore citizens will also have funds credited to their central Provident Fund MediSave accounts. These payments are part of the GST voucher plan aimed at easing the impact of recent GST hikes. Citizens are encouraged to link their national registration identity card to the PayNow service to receive their payouts promptly. For those without linked accounts, alternative payment methods are available, including withdrawal options at designated ATMs. The Thai government is considering ending a 52-year-old ban on afternoon alcohol sales after appeals from the struggling tourism industry. The current law, which bans alcohol sales from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., has faced criticism for further straining businesses already dealing with rising costs and weak consumer spending. The Restaurant Business Club has urged the government to lift the ban to aid bars, hotels, and eateries, particularly as tourists face hot temperatures. The government's target for 2024 is to attract 36.7 million travelers to boost GDP growth. Meanwhile, the Thai Hotels Association is seeking tax deductions or subsidies as the sector struggles with an uneven post-pandemic recovery. Also, Thailand is moving towards reclassifying marijuana as a narcotic, impacting regulations on its use and trade. A recent traffic accident in Seoul left nine people dead and four injured, marking one of the city's worst traffic disasters in recent years and prompting the city to take action. In response to these rising accidents involving drivers 65 and older, Seoul authorities proposed a conditional driver's license to restrict highway and nighttime driving based on driving capabilities. This proposal followed an annual increase in accidents in this age group since 2020, reaching a record high in 2023. 
The accident has reignited public debate with some advocating for stricter medical examinations and revalidation guidelines for senior drivers. Current regulations require drivers older than 75 to renew their licenses every three years. However, cash incentives for voluntary license return have limited success. Others argue improved health due to medical advancements makes age-based restrictions unfair. Some Australians may soon be faced with higher health care costs. St. Vincent's Health Australia has notified the private health fund, NIB, it will terminate its contract within 65 business days if a fair funding agreement is not reached. This decision means NIB insured patients may face increased health care costs at St. Vincent's hospitals beginning October 3rd. Rising inflation and increased operational costs have driven St. Vincent's to this unprecedented step. St. Vincent's CEO emphasized while they have successfully negotiated with other health funds, NIB's offer fails to acknowledge these escalating costs. The Australian Medical Association and Catholic Health Australia criticized the situation, emphasizing the burden on patients and the need for better health insurance regulation. The Australian Medical Association suggested forming an independent private health system authority to resolve such disputes. Also in Australia, a recent audit by Queensland's health watchdog revealed almost half of the state's infertility samples are at risk of misidentification. This has prompted a massive purge of frozen sperm. This issue endangers key genetic information on medical records, raising concerns about potential accidental incest. Queensland's self-regulated IVF industry, one of Australia's largest, faces allegations of malpractice. The audit found systemic issues affecting the quality and safety of samples, with 42% of donations, eggs, and embryos having traceability problems. Patients reported mix-ups and non-disclosure of donors' medical conditions, with instances of children being conceived from different biological fathers. The report recommended destroying non-compliant donor material, potentially impacting thousands of samples labeled as high risk. Australians are cutting back on spending on clothing, liquor, and furniture amid a cost of living crisis. A recent report showed a stagnant spending pattern across many industries compared to the previous year. Department stores and homeware retailers have been hit hardest, while cafes, restaurants, and grocers have maintained steady sales. Food and liquor purchases saw the biggest changes with online retail spaces also impacted. Pharmaceutical goods remained an exception, recording growth. Inflation, rising demand, and high interest rates are prompting Australians to become more cautious with their money, often seeking discounts and bargains before making purchases. This trend is particularly evident in sectors like cars, clothing, and household appliances, where consumers are slowing their spending and taking advantage of sales and events. We have an exciting new announcement. We have launched a new global TV service specifically for the UNN community. Thousands of live TV channels, 60,000 movies on demand, over 30 languages and live sports from around the globe. Between all the separate streaming services and cable for live TV and sports packages, it can cost well over $200 a month. But now with United TV, you can have it all for only $15.99 a month. Go to unitedtv.org and check it out. Get so much more for so much less. And now, the World Situation Report with Kimberly Gogan from the Office of the Guardian. Countries are allegedly walking away from the United States dollar per the order of the dragon. And apparently, they believe this will crash the dollar. But is that really true? Jamie Demon of J.P. Morgan Chase and others predicted a stock market crash would happen on the 5th of July. But the market closes up a few points. 
what's the real story. The remaining Deep State members gather together, hoping for orders to come in from somewhere in the universe overnight tonight. And now, here is the World Situation Report with Kimberly Gogan from the Office of the Guardian. Good afternoon. Well, afternoon my time, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for not being here on Wednesday. Uh, but as you know, I knew this week was going to be a really busy week. Uh, for those of you in the U.S., I hope you had a lovely holiday yesterday. Uh, not everybody had a lovely holiday yesterday. <laughs> um, I guess you would say, I didn't, I worked all day, but uh, definitely not for those that were expecting a lot of influx of cash. Um, it was pretty chaotic most of the day uh, and the day before as everybody was trying to ready themselves uh, for an influx of money. People trying to ready themselves with various old systems they were trying to connect to would be people like uh, the CIA, uh, the Pentagon, uh, the Treasury, uh, the Federal Reserve. Uh, there were also a few other countries as well, uh, such as China, uh, I, Russia. Uh, there were uh, a few other countries like Brazil, uh, and they were all trying to hook up these old systems and old terminals that used to work uh, with the old, old VTX system. And for those of you that don't know, the VTX system was um, created in part by the CIA. Uh, it ran on a level three web or level three of the internet. Uh, and this used to be a backbone for uh, computer uh, financial networks uh, from a bank level, treasury level on down. Uh, they were sadly disappointed when the systems uh, did not connect uh, earlier this week, uh, and therefore they were all concerned about missing the boat. So they spent most of the day on Tuesday and Wednesday uh, trying to hook up new any system, uh, FedNow system, let's try blockchain, let's try other uh, quick file systems of Oracle. Uh, now, quick file systems also shortens down to QFS. So <laughs> it turns out that this new quantum financial system, as they're calling it, was actually not even a quantum financial system, it wasn't even a quantum human computing system, like for example, blockchain and, and some other technologies out there. It wasn't anything new. It was something that has been in the works um, under Oracle systems for a very long time. Uh, Oracle Systems, as you know, is one of the leading providers of banking software and banking products. Uh, and this quick file system, QFS, uh, launched several different banking products for, um, for example, for day trading, and it's supposed to make things faster and that type of thing. And they felt because Oracle had a, um, a leg in as a software provider um, that uh, this would this quick file system as it's called and you can look this up I think it's called SAM SAM if I remember correctly uh, QFS um, <clears throat> under Oracle systems uh, and so since Oracle already had its leg into a lot of the different banks being a provider of software they felt that this would be an easy transition and a secondary option to receive funds from some unknown source on the 4th of July uh, well that system didn't function very long. It doesn't really work in that fashion. Um, it's not designed to process uh, transactions, uh, even for what we call G1 and G2, which would be most of the European Union and the United States, uh, to the magnitude where it's not just processing maybe back-end bank batching systems or something like that. It's it's 
design is not designed to process everybody's credit card and debit card transactions, even in, on a limited basis, let alone worldwide. So the system didn't quite work out. And that left me and them very busy uh, as they continue to hack the light systems, uh, operating systems that we have now uh, taken a hold of. And we have some more updates on that here in just a minute. Uh, another thing, uh, rumor that was going around and uh, apparently uh, fell flat uh, is the stock market crash today. Uh, why did Jamie Demon and everybody else think the stock market was going to crash today? I'm assuming they did because the general consensus of the Order of the Dragon Rothschild family and to some degree the Order of the Black Sun, whatever's left of those two groups, uh, is that they would like to crash the dollar. Now, <clears throat> they still felt if they could crash the dollar, uh, by some crazy means, because they make no sense, that, that somehow they could use a different currency and propel that to being the world's reserve currency, whether that be central bank digital currencies, uh, U.S. note, U.S. Treasury note. And economics just doesn't quite work that way when it's not manipulated. So let's talk about, for a second, the world's reserve currency and what that actually means. Uh, the world's reserve currency means that predominantly the, the most of the trading that happens in the world is done in U.S. dollars, meaning these are high dollar trades like oil, gold, gas. You know, we've talked about this before. But it is not the only world's reserve currency authorized by the IMF or International Monetary Fund at this moment in time. There are also others, such as the Euro, the British Pound, the Japanese Yen, uh, Chinese RMB, the Canadian Dollar, and the Swiss Franc. So there are other reserve currencies, although the US dollar holds the majority of the shares of the market due to BlackRock and BlackRock's black market, off-market trading platforms that were connected to the world's commodities futures trading platforms in nearly every single country. That hasn't been the case for quite a while, as I've told you. Therefore, the backing for all of these commodities transactions really doesn't benefit the U.S. dollar anyway at this moment in time. So. Changing a world's reserve currency or going to multiple reserve currencies, as in the Rothschild plan of having seven to nine of them, doesn't really change the value of the dollar any at this moment in time. Now, the next thing everybody talks about or is talking about, and this is back chatter happening now, is that they're promising people that going to a gold standard is going to change your life. The answer to the question is absolutely not. Converting to an asset-based trading system and away from derivative systems will actually ultimately change your life and lower the cost of things like food. Um, you know, and the th other prices that are rising around, you know, things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, unnecessarily so. Um, the next way they plan on um, crashing the dollar is by convincing other nations to drop the dollar. Now, we've heard about Saudi Arabia. They allegedly have officially dropped the dollar. Okay, great. Unfortunately for Saudi Arabia and nearly every other BRICS country out there, you still hold a significant amount of treasury notes. So when you have a lot of treasury notes or treasury bonds or government bonds of any other type um, denominated in United States dollars, uh, and, and this is another thing the deep state needs to keep in mind, that the that the United States is not the only country currently denominated in U.S. dollars. There are others out there that are still using the dollar as its currency currently because the deep state went in and 
blew up their economy just like they did with the USSR using the same cookie cutter method that they've continuously used throughout history, even in Korea and other countries. Uh, and they haven't quite finished the transition in the process. Countries like that would be the country of Iraq. Uh, in Iraq, a lot of transactions, even just day-to-day going to the grocery store transactions are still done in U.S. dollars, although they're trying to walk away from it. But it's not possible when assets to a central bank are considered debt instruments. Remember, banks work the opposite that we think, like in the way that regular people think, I should say. We think we have a car and we have an asset. We have a house and we have an asset. We have a loan, we have a liability. On the bank side, your loan becomes an asset. And bonds, treasury notes, and otherwise are nothing more than loans. That's it. Uh, and if they were to drop the dollar completely and they were to actually manage to affect the value of the dollar, then the asset base of many countries will go down to probably at least half, if not more, than what it is right now. So the theory that they have is that they're going to come in with insert currency name here. I've heard rainbow dollars, U.S. note, U.S. treasury coins. I've heard all kinds of currencies being floated around, depending on what group is working on what, to actually replace the Federal Reserve dollar or the note. Changing an economy is not going to happen overnight. Changing a currency is not going to happen overnight. It is going to take time to do something without harming everyone in the world and every nation in the world. So if they think the people of BRICS that are being led by the nose by a group of operatives telling them what to do, which is actually what's happening, if they think convincing countries to join BRICS and walk away from the dollar being headed by the Rothschild family right now, this is who's putting out these operatives, uh, is, go is going to help in some way move the entire world away from a dollar and go with the RMB, say, which is their plan, um, as a reserve currency, or insert new currencies overnight, you've got a lot of financial unwinding to do. Never mind when you get down to the average everyday citizen in the world. Never mind all the bonds that are out there on the market that are held by private investors, such as Berkshire Hathaway. You may or may not know that Goldman Sachs is one of the largest buyers of treasury notes and government notes from the United States, denominated all in dollars. Uh, same thing goes for J.P. Morgan. Uh, J.P. Morgan processes most of the on-market um, oil transactions, not only for the United States government, but also for other countries, all denominated in dollars. So, brilliant people and operatives of the deep state, listen up here for just a second. Unless you solve that problem and all of the coupons and, you know, notes that are issued off of that, uh, derivatives or government's versions of derivatives would be treasury coupons um, or treasury strips, they're sometimes called in the market. If you were to try to unwind all of that, you're, <laughs> you're going to lose every bank in the world, genetic shareholder people. You will lose every hedge fund that's out there ridiculous deep state people. And in addition to that, right now, every currency in the world literally has a stake in the U.S. dollar because they all hold treasury notes and treasury bonds that back their respective currencies. If it's not that, then it's Federal Reserve bonds and notes, and then there's the repo market and everything else. I don't want to get into too many details and make people's head hurt um, on the news. But the point is, is that you would crash every currency in the world, including your precious RMB. 
You know, China's economy is largely based on trade with the United States, whether it be, for example, China Petroleum having letters of credit or documented, documented or DLC letters of credit that come from people they buy and sell oil from you know, uh, with China Petroleum, or maybe it's Apple because Apple's huge over there. Maybe it's Ford. But you all have documentary letters of credit based on some bank, whether it be Wells Fargo, HSBC, one of these other large banks that all have these dollar-denominated assets, or they'll issue you the documentary letter of credit. So the quickest way to burn Russia, China, India, and <laughs> South Africa, and everybody else, Saudi Arabia, and all the other countries, Iran, that are considering, you know, this as an alternative to the United States in the dollar, you have just failed Economics 101. Uh, so in the news, in the last couple of days, they're getting other countries on board, such as Zambia and Zimbabwe, who are considering passing laws that make trade in U.S. dollars illegal in those countries. Now, I understand they're angry, and I understand they're angry about the U.S. dollar, and I understand that we shouldn't have a monopoly as a reserve currency. I completely am in agreement. But you cannot stop this car... <laughs> slam on the brakes at 140 miles an hour and expect the whole world to be okay because it's not going to be okay. And it's not going to put China in charge of anything, which is what the Rothschild's plan actually is. It's not going to happen. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you will burn the capital reserves of nearly every single bank on the planet. And then, therefore, then you have a crashed, quote-unquote, banking system that you intend to buy back for pennies on the dollar. But the way you're driving operatives around tells me you know zero about finance. Absolutely zero. Because you're going to burn everything to the ground. Everybody's going to have worthless papers. A loaf of bread in any given country will probably cost something to the tune of about $10,000. Next. Lovely people of the Q. Let's call about them the lovely people of Q or Operation Trust. Here's another reason why you have a problem, people. Telling people to keep cash because eight, ten days of darkness and you're going to have to, you know, have money on hand and, and whatever on hand, you know, food and this and that. Well, food, maybe that makes sense to me. But having cash on hand doesn't mean a gosh darn thing if you just burned everybody's economy to the ground because Nobody, your money is going to be worth nothing. I don't care if you're paying in cash or euro, cash, Swiss francs, Chinese RMB, dongs, dinars. I don't care what currency you think you're going to buy something in. You will have burned every economy in the world. Now, one other kink in their plan. Mm -hmm. Currently, the International Monetary Fund and their version of how to evaluate a, a, a currency is completely and totally incorrect. In other words, if they have a geopolitical reason, they will drop the value of a country's currency, regardless of their global, uh, their GDP, uh, regardless of what kind of production they have to back their currency. It doesn't matter. Case in point, Iraq. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever when the GDP of that country is the same or similar to, and then if I add black market oil trading out of there, it's even higher, but it's the same if not similar to, for example, Singapore. There's absolutely no reason why Singapore's currency is at like six or seven, depending on the day, to one to the U.S. dollar, and why Iraq's is like, you know, 100,000 to one or whatever it is these days. Um, that's the IMF's way of controlling countries and getting them to do what they want them to do. Uh, also, they use their friend and partner, the World Bank, to do that as well. And the World Bank puts countries into debt so that they can say, okay, well, you can't pay us right now in U.S. dollars or whatever currency they're expecting for that contract, whatever, whatever countries currency is being backed by the production line 
that the World Bank's contract is denominated in. So, as an example, this is important to understand. Production lines currently back currencies. In the real world of currencies, it's all about production lines. That's why gross domestic product is important. That's why the amount of trade that the country does through the World Trade Organization or otherwise is important. Now, if you get a loan from the World Bank and it's denominated in dollars, then yes, it's a debt to that country, but it's an asset to the United States. That makes sense. It goes behind the U.S. dollar as credit. So the country might have a debt in U.S. dollars, but what they then do is they go in with their Believe it or not, there is a group of people that call themselves the World Bank and or IMF Enforcement Unit. They carry badges and everything. Who are these people? They're not legally on the books anywhere. No one knows who they are, but they're a group of dangerous people that go around and threaten countries much like the IRS does to us. And not just the IRS, but the tax authority in respective nations. And if the country can't pay, which oftentimes they can't because they're so in debt, then, or their currency is worth next to nothing, then they'll go in and take an in-ground asset or a lien on an in-ground asset. Now, what is that worth to the United States dollar? Nothing, people, nothing. Nothing, deep state, nothing. Because unless they send someone in to mine said resources, even if it's one nugget of gold a year, then that production contract and that lien is not worth anything. It's worth nothing in the world of supply and demand, which is what values currencies. I know this is a lot of financial information, but it has to be put out there because even if they were successful in getting money yesterday, let's just say they were successful in getting money, even if they were, their method of crashing the dollar is absolutely insane. It's ridiculous. It's never going to crash anything. I don't know who gave them this plan, but they must be laughing at you from the beyond at this point in time, because I know I am, but that doesn't mean I can't run around and try to make sure that everybody doesn't make a mistake. And quite frankly, let's just say I didn't exist. They're still going to fail. now. Now, because I exist, what will end up happening is whatever currency they choose, if we so chose to register that within the financial system, we would just issue those bonds and those denominations because we are the currency curator of M1 for the planet. That's why. And we can issue bonds or debts or currencies or whatever we want right from here and and you don't even have to think about it, and it will take approximately 15 to 20 minutes to fix everything that they're doing. So I am not concerned about this type of thing. Next rumor that people are concerned about right now is that they're talking about the same people with the operatives that are running around in circles are talking about blackouts. Oh, we're going to have 10 days of darkness. They're going to shut off the grid. They don't have any access to any country's grid at this moment in time. You know, does the power sometimes go out when there's a lot of heat? Sure. Um, in some countries, they're, you know, less fortunate than the U.S. is. But it's the U.S. that they're focused on with false flags and attacks and all kinds of different things. Well, that's not going to work out either. And quite frankly, I highly doubt they're going to pull any trigger, even if they had the opportunity to do so and could figure out a way and rally like they did in California a few years ago when they hit the transformer with the directed energy weapon. Um, you're still not going to be able to achieve that task with nuclear power, and you're not talking just about a transformer now, and there's a lot of bad things that could actually happen from doing that. Not only that, I don't believe they have the resources to make that happen because they're certainly not going to put their elite butts into an aircraft and go hit a button themselves, nor would they even know how to. 
I don't even know if they know where their elite butt is at this point in time. But it certainly looks like that's not going to happen either at this moment. But we have to be ever diligent. There were a lot of threats going on out there about cyber attacks and those types of things uh, uh, over the weekend. I'm sorry, it's not the weekend. Huh. We had one day, <laughs> holiday, over the holiday here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you unequivocally, the only people that were hacking the U.S. computers was actually U.S. people. Uh, you could you could thank our fine intelligence agencies for that, and the NSA and some other folks uh, that were doing that. Uh, even placed a call in the last few days to the NSA, telling them that this is not going to work and that I know where they got their technology from, and those people are no longer around anymore. Uh, it didn't really end well. Um, I hung up the call and on the diplomatic line, never received a call back, and didn't expect to, but that's okay. They're just back in the waiting section. We have more waiters than we have restaurants at this point. I'm just kidding, it's not restaurants, but you understand what I'm saying. We have way more waiters in this world. So speaking of waiters, uh, today would have been the day that governments received budget money and mm, all kinds of different things were supposed to happen today. So operatives were going to get paid, everybody's getting paid because of the big win that was going to happen yesterday. Well, when none of that happened, mm, this is the reason why um, I am late and not with Sunny today on the news, is because it is complete and total deep state chaos out there, unbelievable chaos. We also have another situation happening today, and today is a new moon. So happy new moon, everybody. And the deep state has was expecting to get some orders, instructions, and money. Maybe it's not for they th their thinking. Maybe the money doesn't come because of a trigger that would be tripped on the 4th of July. I don't know what the trigger is, honestly. Uh, they kind of talk a little crazy. Uh, they still think that there's an alien race that's going to give them some money. I'm not sure. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about why they might think that, I think. Um, and then, of course, today would be the start of the first uh, meetings that would take place between uh, the parents and uh, at that time it would be the Draco uh, and they would start every year around this time and talk about the plans and then issue money for the following year and then and then on down to the covens next and then on down to the families and then on down to governments and operatives from there on out so you know we're going through this process so they figure and here is their impression of what is going to happen they have bought themselves a little more time because they figure the full moon really isn't until later on this evening, uh, Eastern Standard Time. I think it's supposed to be uh, around 7 o'clock or something tonight. Uh, and they figure that it could take overnight before they get their orders because, you know, they never participated on that level, so they don't know. Uh, if the orders actually come out at the beginning of the meeting or on the new moon or, you know, during the new moon, maybe at the exact time of the new moon in some other location in the world, who knows what they're thinking. But they really truly believe that the orders come from a alien connection and communication line that they believe to be, number one, in Antarctica. And the second location they believe that this phone call will come into uh, is in Greenland. Uh, it's not called Thule uh, Military Base anymore. It's called, it begins with a P. It's like p some kind of p Pfeiffer or something like that. But anyway, it's not Pfizer. <laughs> so now they have people on standby at both locations waiting to receive an incoming communication from an alien race which uh, they've been there now for a few days. Uh, they don't know it could have happened any time, according to them, from three days before the new moon, possibly up to three days after. Uh, 
hence the reason why the biggest rumors of Nasara Jasara RVs and all of this is now Monday the 8th, because uh, that would put them three days past the full moon. Uh, I don't know. They're just really cold and they're hanging out. There's a group of people really cold and hanging out. So we thought about it. I'm like, well, are the group of people that are cold and hanging out doing anything? Uh, no. Um, they're just probably drinking coffee and trying to stay warm, I guess, where they're at. Uh, I guess um, the, sometimes it's bad for certain people to tell the story. Now, I'm not entirely sure they're going to leave there um, upright. Uh, it, they could get frostbite. They could get hypothermia. You just don't know what could happen when you're in such a remote location. Um, yeah, so we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens uh, over the next couple of days, how long they stay. Uh, but you do need some. So let's... Uh, See if they report back to everybody and tell them that nobody called and no money came through any kind of a system or those types of things. So speaking of systems, I'm going to give you a little bit of an update uh, as well on systems. So we've told, about, told you about the fact that we put transmuters on the dark system so that we could fully integrate the light system without any issues or any problems. Uh, and we kept doing this ebb and flow thing. We'd get to like 98, 99%, and then it would go back to like 50%, and then it would go forward a little bit, back a little bit. And it was doing the same thing for Earth. Um, we feel like we're on an energetic roller coaster. And if you feel like that, this is the reason why. <laughs> uh, because I can't figure out where it's coming from. And I think we finally have figured out <clears throat> the secret, I hope, uh, to why they believe information is going to come through. So at one point in time, uh, I told you, I think it was like last week, about Elon Musk saying that these humans think they're going to transfer their consciousness into an AI system and live forever and then choose to transfer that consciousness into another vessel, a body, or whatever, uh, and then, you know, become, I guess, gods or whatever they believe, or immortal. Now, that program doesn't work anymore, and I am not so sure they would have allowed them to do that anyway, even when the parties that ran the program actually <laughs> could do it. And actually, we're still with us. But others that transfer con their consciousness into computer systems, I would say even before death, would be people like, or folks, I should say, because these aren't people, uh, Lucifer, uh, the Red Queen, whose real name was Artemis. You guys remember a few years back, everybody talking about the Artemis Accords or the Jupiter Accords. Remember those? Guess who signed those and who they signed up with? Yes, a fifth level lower astral demon that at the time had some gatekeeper capabilities way back in 2018 when those agreements were signed. Now, that party is no longer with us, but her consciousness in, to some degree was spread far and wide. So we talked months ago about alien technology and how it runs and the effects of alien technology on this planet, not only on the planet, but also off the planet and definitely within AI systems. So can you imagine someone transferring their, I guess you essence, energy, and so forth into a Mm, for lack of a better term, let's call it a sphere. Uh, the spheres are larger than the one. There's a picture out there with uh, Trump and the Saudi Arabian king, I think it is at the time, uh, you know, around the sphere. And everybody's like, what is the sphere? What is the sphere? Uh, they're much larger than that, usually. 
uh, unless they come in a beltway or whatever. But normally the consciousness that's in that ball, if it's dark, then it belongs to, say, a fraction of or a portion of the consciousness of the Red Queen or Artemis. Or maybe it was Marduk's consciousness, or maybe it's <laughs> Lucifer's consciousness in totality. Now, humans on this planet can become personally affected by the consciousness of another being. Also, if the consciousness still exists, and the essence still exists, and the energy still exists, you can actually see it almost sometimes forming a um, – it, it looks like a giant blob of plasma, for lack of a better term. And that giant blob of plasma can be formed from only a portion, for example, of a being's essence, energy, or consciousness. Now – couldn't figure out why, you know, why are we still cleaning? You know, I mean, we have cleaned so much stuff and then there'll be stuff that's not there today, but I'd wake up tomorrow morning and there's more stuff. And it turns out that these consciousness balls and soul cubes and all kinds of things they put themselves into predominantly from the lower astral. Um, or the null zone, uh, which is the space in between lower astral and the upper astral. And they transfer it into, for example, the Omega system or the Kronos system, or sometimes they can even transfer it to a planet such as Earth. And then the being still exists. Therefore, it can still make decisions to create things, on its own, as long as energy is still be, being transmuted into a dark energy. But theirs still existed until it's used up completely. It's no longer powering that being. But they could actually replicate this process thousands, if not millions of times for each being. The same thing goes for the Abraxas. <clears throat> Marduk, Inky, and Enlil. The consciousness is out there. It's still making, quote unquote, decisions to make my life miserable. I'm sure they didn't do that for me. But, um, you know, it's a war fought with attrition. You know, if we can wear the light people down, wear the light workers down, you know, we can continuously do this infinitely, they felt, with this process. Now, this is part of the reason why I don't believe they would have offered this same service to the people like Elon Musk or the people like the Palabensinis or the Orosinis. And the reason why I don't think that they would have allowed for this immortal process to happen is because these people don't think very highly of them. And quite frankly, neither do I. What value would it be putting their brain into a, a, a sentient AI or their consciousness, so to speak, into a sentient AI and let them keep making decisions like the ones they're making now? That would be a no. That would even be a no from an evil alien race. That would be a no. Who would want those people? They don't make decisions. Look at what they're doing. You know, they can't even get orders and instructions right, you know, that were <laughs> – detailed out to the letter, predominantly because without one of these beings, you're never going to make it. But when things start to reinstall themselves, it's frustrating. I'm like, where did this come from? Oh, this was something left behind Marduk, by Marduk as an example. But was it really? Is it just an ongoing standing order from the consciousness? The answer to the question turns out to be actually yes. So by pulling all of those keystones that were tied to their souls from systems this weekend and throughout the morning this morning, I should say the week, I keep saying it's the weekend. I don't know why I think yesterday was Sunday. I still do for some reason. Okay, over the, over the day yesterday and the day before and this morning as well, now we're going somewhere because things are not reinstalling themselves anymore. Now, 
What that did for the deep state is it gave the deep state hope. They would see a glimmer of something showing up underneath HSBC in Hong Kong or Wells Fargo in San Francisco or the Federal Reserve or something under Langley. And they would think, oh, here it comes, here it comes, just as it promised us, just as it promised us. And then it goes away. Well, still the gatekeeper over here and that and because this other party whose consciousness existed is not the gatekeeper anymore it doesn't have the ability to allow things to come in and manifest into reality anymore but pulling all of the soul keystones now that is going to make a big difference because no longer should they as long as we make sure we got them all and this is still a work in progress for today for me. Um, as long as we make sure we got them all, then that means that there'll be no more regeneration of things that we have taken out. And no more days ending in Y for the deep state for them to think that something is going to appear or to wreak havoc on the planet for a while. So much so we have to clean it up. And it's not just this planet. It goes everywhere sometimes. So I'm really happy with the progress of that. And what we did yesterday appears that uh, appears to be 100% um, spot on on pulling these stones because we're not having that regeneration that we saw before. Now, uh, on the flip side of it, we had some neutral stuff uh, that was still showing up. Um, in places like uh, Eagle Mountain, Yellowstone Park, and a few other places uh, in, in uh, northern New Mexico, Utah area. It was kind of a large area. Um, and uh, those things were also removed this morning as well. So let's just keep our fingers crossed there and hope that this little experiment, because this is something that's never been done before, and we asked about it, um, asked some others about it as well, the Universal Council, uh, to see if this was something that's ever happened. So we could try to, before we did it, we wanted to obviously make sure we weren't going to have a negative fallout from, from doing so. So um, thus far, it seems to be going very well. So I'm happy with the results of that, and I'm happy with our progress there. Hopefully, I will no longer have to deal with things regenerating themselves and trying to reattach themselves to the light system from here on out. So happy about that. Next, uh, I do have a little bit of an update for you on the marketplace. I meant to give it to you on Monday, uh, but, um, you know, th things just got a little crazy, and I was trying to get the news done uh, for you. So the marketplace. Um, where we're kind of at with that is we have tried to morph the current software and programs that we're using uh, into a full vendor service marketplace. We've had difficulties with shipping. We figured our way around that. Uh, we also had some difficulties with the vendor side not being quite so user friendly. Uh, we want to make it more user friendly than, for example, an Etsy or an Amazon uh, to utilize for you to sell your your um, your products and technologies and things like that. Because we're looking at the marketplace for us as a long term usable uh, marketplace that will not only be for your things, but we can also have communications through the marketplace for a, for example, farmer's intranet where people can buy and sell um, uh, their products internally without dealing with commodities future markets if they still exist for a while. Um, uh, without dealing with those types of prices so that they can feed their cattle and exchange grain and and buy and sell used farming equipment and those types of things. And another phase of that is actually also going to be um, an intranet for education. Uh, we're also hoping to launch in future phases a health intranet where you can pick and choose your provider. Uh, they, of course, all will work with, with assurance. Uh, you can choose natural medicine. You can choose whatever it is. You know, this is free will and uh, – no, sorry, not free will – sovereign will. 
uh, and this is uh, your choice personally on how you choose to treat yourself. Um, and um, and we want to make those resources available as well uh, in different phases. Um, so the platform that we're working on um, with the difficult parts in in not owning the coding, for example, for uh, the vendor plugins and those types of things kind of left us at a, at a spot where if we had launched it, we're going to have a lot of difficulty with our store owners. Uh, payments, you know, it was kind of limited in what kind of payments, uh, payment methods people could use. Uh, you know, as you know, um, credits and cards and debit cards aren't really that great in some countries, you know, as far as payouts are concerned. Some countries use PayPal, some don't. Some use Western Union, some don't. And it's hard to find a consistent uh, payment platform utilizing uh, the plugins that we had available or that you know most of your WooCommerce and and um, BigCommerce and Shopify and and Square and you know all the other platforms that we looked at um, offer uh, to integrate. So we made a, a decision in the last uh, several days to uh, code our own marketplace. Now we have a group uh, of coders that is going to do this for us. Uh, it will be a user-friendly uh, platform for our staff uh, should we need to make some changes and those types of things. Uh, so the base uh, PHP coding for it will um, be able to be utilized by people we have currently uh, on staff as well. And these guys will stay on with us for about a year to make sure things go well and that we can continuously grow the platform into what the world will eventually need uh, to um, help launch care initiatives. Uh, we can also have a life assurance uh, platform as another phase, uh, as an example there. We can also have an essentials uh, um, option uh, attached to the marketplace as well. And we just figured out that we are not going to be able to make this platform robust enough in order to handle what we need now and what we need in the future. So we have signed that contract. Uh, we should be sending out uh, first payment and they have selected a team for us uh, to work with uh, to getting everything up and running. Um, and the time frame on that appears to be a maximum of, of around 90 days. Now that, of course, you know, it can go a week either way or whatever it is, but once it's done, it'll be done right. And this platform will grow with us with all our additional things we want to add to the platform. We, of course, want to add a music platform to that as well, which we've already got the look and feel and the design for uh, that was done quite a while ago. So we figured that this would be the best way to go. Now, in the interim, uh, we are probably going to add a little small marketplace. Um, it's not really for outside vendors. Um, it would just be for um, our uh, essential oils and, you know, I don't know if we're going to do um, – merchandise like hats and that type of thing again I, that's up to you guys maybe you can comment on our app to tell us if it's something you want or don't want um, and we could consider doing that uh, we also are uh, probably going to consider there's been some people uh, that have um, uh, products that we believe in and we might add those things to that uh, we also have a, a few things uh, that have been suggested by uh, some of our new earth folks uh, that are uh, products that you could use or things that you could use for, uh, for example, for health concerns or for other concerns that we can put links in there too. So that'll help support as well. And it's quite expensive to do this. That's why we're going to have to do it in phases because <laughs> um, 
but it'll still get done and I'm going to be, we're going to be much happier uh, with the product. And those of you that are considering being in like, for example, the education division of care or something like that will probably be much happier because you'll have a way to get out your initiatives a lot quicker uh, through a marketplace like this. So um in the long run, it's going to be great. In the short term, we've gone as far as we could with what we had available at the time uh, as far as software and, and other internet programs. Uh, but this ultimately is going to be what we need. And, you know, yeah, it's another couple of months, but I'd rather have a couple of months and have it be right and have it be buildable, uh, uh, mean, meaning we can add additional phases as we come up with international co-ops for farmers or something like that. Um, but I think that this is the better way to go. So, um, so we've done that. So uh, that is the update on the marketplace. I wanted to make sure I got that out at the end of today's news. And that wraps up the situation report for the 5th of July, 2024. And I look forward to talking to you on Monday. Uh, hopefully we'll have some good results. And either way, I'm going to see you on Monday because we have an interesting broadcast. So have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and I will see you Monday. And you'll see me. Want to share news from UNN? Help us change the face of social media and use it for good. Connect with us through our online channels. Our social media team creates clips from each newscast you can easily share with people you care about. That's also where you'll find our UNN Meme of the Day, a great way to encourage critical thinking. Links to all our social media sites are available at the bottom of our website at unitednetwork.earth. Let's change the face of news together. And that wraps up today's news update. Please share UNN with your friends and family. We need everyone to come together and help restore our planet. When news happens in your area, record and share it with us so together we can share it with the world. Remember, if it's going to be, it's up to me. I'm Sunny Galt. Join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the real news.